Hi, we're starting a new chapter on nuclear structure and radioactivity. And so I thought I would lead off with some of the really interesting history that um, is in the background of this field. There were some really interesting characters and really, really fascinating um, history that took place in this time. So let's get started. Um, Henry Becquerel lived from 1852 to 1908. He, along with the Curies, received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1903 for being the first to discover radioactivity as a phenomenon that was separate from that of X-rays, and then to document the differences between the two. He was actually from a rich family that produced about four generations of scientists. He was the physics chair at the National Natural History Museum, and interestingly enough, he was also the chief engineer of highways and roads, which I think is kind of a, a fun title. His PhD work and a lot of his early research was studying phosphorescence of materials, light, and things like that. And um, it's often said about his research that this is a case of chance favoring the prepared mind because what he was doing was he was studying um, some uranium salts uh, for their phosphorescent properties. Um, it was originally thought, he thought that um, some of these x-rays might be emitted from some of these radioactive salts, these naturally occurring uranium salts. Um, it might be a phosphorescent effect. But the more he observed them, the more he realized that this wasn't really phosphorescence because the radiation that originally triggered the emission of the x-rays wasn't coming from an external source. He came to realize that it was the rock itself that was causing and emitting the radiation, and he documented this very carefully. And this image here in the lower right corner is um, some exposure of the photographic plates from these uranium salts. And if you look really close, you can see that in this bottom exposure, this bottom you know, blot of exposure, exposure on the radioactive from the radioactivity there's a cross and so what he did was he put um, this little jewelry Maltese cross thing that he had in between the salt and the photographic plate to prove that it was the salt itself that was emitting this radiation so that's kind of an interesting story about him now, of course, for interesting stories, you don't have to look much further than Curie's. So Pierre and Mary Curie were awarded the Nobel Prize along with Becquerel in 1903 for their work on radioactivity. Um, Marie Curie was the first woman to be awarded the Nobel Prize, and she was also the first person to obtain two Nobel Prizes, um, and she won the second Nobel Prize for the discovery of polonium and radium in 1911 when they isolated it. So what uh, some of her early work was, was she realized that, um, again, like Becquerel, that this radiation was being emitted from the rocks themselves. One of the experiments that she used to study the fact that they were emitting radiation was that um, around in the air around the rocks, um, it was ionizing the air. And so she proved that the air became conductive in the presence of these, um, these, this ore, this radioactive ore. And then she went on later and found other sources of radioactivity other than uranium salts, the polonium um, and the radium, which she then isolated. To this day, um, of course, uh, she died of uh, cancer from working with all this radiation over the years. Uh, she used to carry tubes of radium around in the pockets of her, her dresses when she was working. To this day, some of her effects and her papers are considered too radioactive to handle. Um, so if you want to study her papers, you have to wear protective clothing when you do it. So. I mean, she was really exposed to a, a lot of radiation. It made her sick several times over the years, and then she finally died of cancer from the exposure to this radiation in her 60s. You might not know about Mary Curie that she was very active in humanitarian efforts. Specifically, in World War I, she developed um, a whole bunch of uh, x-ray units. Um, she pioneered the use of these x-rays in the field, and um, she had 20 mobile units. You can see one pictured here, and 200 other units that were used to take x-rays of injured soldiers and help treat them. Um, it's estimated that about over a million soldiers were treated with her radiological units. Um, so that's an important contribution.
So she was born Polish, and her Polish identity was really important to her all throughout her life. But um, she married um, Pierre Curie. They met in Paris, where she was going to school. He actually found her lab space. Um, it, she was having trouble finding some lab space, and he found some for her. And then they um, began to work together, and they developed feelings for each other. And she found um, a partner in life and also in work for the rest of their lives. So that's a very nice um, story there. Okay. Now, um, another, you know, sort of parent of nuclear physics is Ernest Rutherford. We studied him a lot in Modern One when we talked about the gold foil experiment. Um, he's still considered the father of nuclear physics because of that experiment laying the groundwork for the discovery of the nucleus. And he was also able to observe that radioactive elements underwent a process of decay over time, which varied from element to element. And in 1919, he is said to have carried out the very first, um, you know, sort of nuclear experiment where he transmuted one element, oxygen, into another element, nitrogen. And papers at the time called it the splitting of the atom. Okay, so um, Ernest Rutherford, father of nuclear physics. Rutherford actually also showed that the radiation came in three different types, and he called it alpha, beta, and gamma after the first letters of the Greek alphabet. Alpha radiation, we'll talk about this more later, but alpha particles are helium nuclei, and they can be stopped by clothing or paper because they're very large. Beta radiation is electrons or positrons. They're usually more penetrating, but they're still stopped by the top layers of your skin. And then gamma radiation is very high energy photons, and those are much more um, penetrating radiation, and you need water or lead generally to stop it. So those are the three kinds of radiation that are emitted naturally from elements. The discovery of the neutron is a really cool story. Um, in 1920, Ernest Rutherford conceived the possible existence of the neutron. In particular, Rutherford considered that the disparity found between the atomic number of an atom and its atomic mass could be explained if there were some neutrally charged particles in the nucleus. And he considered the neutron to be a neutral double, which with a, a proton being orbited by an electron. Um, in 1930, uh, Ambart Sumian and Ivanenko, probably slaughtered that, sorry, um, from the Soviet Union found that in contrary to the prevailing opinion of the time, the nucleus couldn't consist of protons and electrons. And they proved that some neutral particles had to be present beside the proton. Um, and then in 1931, Beth and Becker in Germany found that if you had very energetic alpha particles emitted from polonium that fell on certain light elements like beryllium, boron, or lithium, um, then it, it produced an unusually penetrating radiation. Uh, at first, they thought this radiation was gamma radiation, although it was more penetrating than any other gamma rays known. Um, but from the details of the experimental results, it was very difficult to interpret what this meant. And so the next important contribution in the discovery of the neutron actually came from the Curie's daughter, Marie and Pierre Curie's daughter, Irene. Um, again, I'm probably slaughtering this, I'm sorry. But um, Irene Joliot Curie, she was Marie's daughter, and Frederick Joliot in Paris. And they showed that if this unknown radiation fell on paraffin, wax, or any other hydrogen-containing compound, then it actually ejected protons of very high energy. Um, so this guy right here, uh, Joliot Curie, um, he's her husband. Um, and in 1940, he had a very interesting history, I think. At the time of the Nazi invasion in 1940, he smuggled his working documents and his materials to England. And during the French occupation, he took an active part in the French resistance. During the Paris uprising in August 1944, he served in the prefecture of the police and he manufactured for his fellow insurgents Molotov cocktails that were the uh, principal weapon that the resistance used against the German tanks. And it was the scene of some of the most intense fighting during the uprising. It's also worth noting that when this guy married um, Irene Curie, they both just ended up hyphenating their name. Because if you work in physics, at the time especially, it probably didn't hurt to have the last name Curie in there somewhere, right? Okay. <laughs> and in addition, look at this guy. This may very well be the most attractive physicist that I have ever seen. Look at that. It's like a glamour shot. Okay. Um, 
Continuing on with the story of the neutron, in 1932, James Chadwick, um, pictured here, suggested that the new radiation consisted of uncharged particles of approximately the mass of a proton. So he, or he's suggesting it's a new particle. Um, and he performed a series of experiments that verified the suggestion. And these uncharged particles eventually came to be known as neutrons. Um, from the Latin or Greek word root for neutral, and then you add the Greek ending O-N because they already had the electron and the proton. So if you're suggesting another fundamental particle that goes into an atom, you may as well put an O-N on there, right? Okay, so neutrons were really difficult to discover. Um, it took a long time to do it because they are neutrally charged, right? So they're not going to interact with matter, matter via the Coulomb. And they're, and they're tiny, you know, they're the same size as a proton. And so it's very difficult um, for them to be detected. All right, now to the boring stuff. Well, it's not boring stuff, but uh, the less exciting stuff than the history. Um, stuff that hopefully this uh, you've probably already heard, but it never hurts to say it again. So some properties of nuclei, it's important that we clarify these before we go on into our study of radioactivity. Um, so all nuclei, of course, in case you hadn't heard, are composed of protons and neutrons. The exception, of course, is ordinary hydrogen, which just has the single proton. The atomic number Z is the number of protons in the nu nucleus. This is the, also sometimes called the charge number. The neutron number N is the number of neutrons in the nucleus. Most of the time, though, we just use the mass number, and then we use the atomic number and hope that people can subtract. Okay, so that's the deal there. So the mass number A is the number of nucleons, which is the sum of the number of protons and neutrons. It's not the same as the mass, okay, as we'll talk about later when we discuss binding energies. So the symbolism that often gets used is if you use the chemical symbol of the element, here I just showed generic one X, there is no element symbol X, so there you go. Um, and then the superscript to the left is the mass number. Um, so for example, for aluminum, aluminum 27, and then the uh, number of protons is 13. Usually you don't put the number of protons though, because if you're already giving the chemical symbol for the element, then that tells you the number of protons, so it's sort of redundant. So most of the time, we just indicate which isotope it is by putting the mass number up here in the upper left hand side. So the nuclei of all atoms of a particular element have to have the same number of protons, otherwise it's a different element, right? But I, I used the word isotope a second ago. Isotopes of an element have the same number of protons, but different mass numbers. In other words, they have different numbers of neutrons. Now you can have naturally occurring isotopes of different elements. So for example, Carbon is a really common one. You usually think of carbon-12, but there's other naturally occurring isotopes of carbon, carbon-11, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Um, and they occur at different, um, in, in different percentages in the Earth. Um, the convenient unit for the mass is the atomic mass unit. We'll often use U to abbreviate that. One atomic mass unit is uh, 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. This is based on the definition that the mass of one atom of carbon-12 is exactly 12 atomic mass units. So just like in other areas of science, we're being very arrogant here <laughs> and basing it on carbon, which is what we're made of and the basis of life. So really, our unit is all about us. We're just very egocentric. Anyway, we can also express the mass in MeV per C squared. MeV is mega electron volts, so that's 10 to the 6th electron volts, and then of course per C squared. And this comes from Einstein's famous equation relating mass and energy, E is equal to MC squared. So you just put the mass in terms of the energy in electron volts and you divide through by the C squared. Okay? It's important to realize that in this unit, the C squared is, um, is there, it actually is a number. So so if you wanted to convert it back, you would really have to divide whatever energy you've got there by 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second squared in order to do the conversion to uh, kilograms or whatever else. Okay, um, so here's uh, masses of some of the selected particles that we're going to be talking about with their various units. You can convert from kilograms 
two atomic mass units, two MeV per C squared. Okay, so the mass of your nucleons is around 938, 939 MeV per C squared. They're roughly one atomic mass unit, and they're roughly 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms or so. And there's differences between the protons and the neutrons. And of course, the mass of the electron is a fraction of that. It's about 1,000 times smaller than the mass of a proton or a neutron. Now the proton, of course, has that single positive charge. It's oppositely charged to the electron, but they have the same magnitude of charge, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The neutron doesn't have a charge, which is why it was so hard to find, um, but it's easy to detect with the modern detectors and devices that we have now. Now all nucleons, just like electrons, are fermions, so they're spin one-half particles, and that's their intrinsic spin. Because they have an intrinsic spin, they also have a magnetic moment, just like the electron has a magnetic moment. However, their magnetic moments are much weaker than the magnetic moments of the electrons, and that's just because they're a thousand times more massive. So, in terms of the Bohr magneton, which is a unit that we defined previously, EH bar over two times the mass of the electron, if instead you do EH bar over two times the mass of a proton, that gives you the nuclear magneton, okay, which is sort of the order of magnitude of the um, magnetic moments for these, these nucleons. And that one is, of course, about a thousand times smaller than the magnetic moment for the Bohr magneton. So if the Bohr magneton is 5.79 times 10 to the minus 5 eV per Tesla, then the nuclear magneton is 3.15 times 10 to the minus 8 eV per Tesla. It's a lot smaller. Now, we do use these um, magnetic moments of protons and neutrons to conduct nuclear magnetic resonance experiments. Probably more familiar with the medical term that they use, magnetic resonance imaging, and they, they just named it that way so that people wouldn't panic over the word nuclear in a medical treatment, okay? Because they're, everyone's afraid of the word nuclear. It's kind of silly, but that's why they do it. Um, however, if you're working in a lab um, and you're using the same idea, the exact same idea, then they'll call it NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. Okay, so the idea though is that you have a nucleus that has a spin angular momentum and then in the presence of an external magnetic field, of course, um, it'll want to align with the field. But because of the uncertainty principle, it's not allowed to. So it takes certain quantized values, quantized orientations um, with respect to the magnetic field. This is very similar to the physics that we learned about with the Zeeman effect, except it has to do with the spin angular momentum instead of the orbital angular momentum. Okay? So shown here are some possible projections on the, the z-axis. The magnitude of the spin angular momentum is the, exactly the same as the magnitudes of other angular momentums. Um, so it's just your uh, quantum number times i plus 1 h-bar. Okay? It's the same idea. Now for a nucleus with spin 1 half, there's only spin up and spin down. Um, so you've got your magnetic moment sort of as aligned as it can be with the magnetic field or anti-parallel. Okay, those are the two orientations if the magnetic field here is pointing up. And so since that does split it into two different energy levels, it's actually possible to observe transitions between these two spin states using nuclear magnetic resonance. Okay. So an MRI machine, which is based on NMR, what happens is you have a, uh, you, you go into the MRI machine, there's very, very strong magnetic fields in there um, on the order of a few Tesla, and Tesla is a huge magnetic field. But what happens is the magnetic field is not the same strength everywhere in the tube. It's a non-uniform field. And they use the spatial variations in the strength of this external field. Um, and that causes different splitting, different energy level splitting um, between the spin up and spin down states because the magnetic field varies. And the magnetic field is directly proportional to this delta E here. Okay. Hydrogen is used because it's the simplest and also for magnetic um, resonance imaging for medical purposes we're like 70 percent water so we've got hydrogen everywhere okay so what they do is they send radio waves um, in a range of frequencies that they know will um, result in exciting these 
states and different regions, okay, because they kind of know what the strength of the magnetic field is as it varies across the tube in the region of interest. So they know what energies of waves they need to send in. So they send in these radio waves because the radio waves energy matches the energy of this delta E here, okay, depending on where it is. And then the radio waves cause that excitation from this ground minimum state into the high spin state. So what happens is it's in an orientation where it's aligned with the magnetic field, but you can flip the spin if you give it enough energy. If you give it the right delta E, you can flip the spin to the higher energy state and then it'll precess around the magnetic field in that direction instead of upwards. So you're just exciting it to a higher energy state. And then what they do is they monitor the absorption of the radio waves and match that with the spatial location to generate the, these maps, okay? So you can create a map because of the spatial dependence of the magnetic field that causes different energy excitations at different locations within the body. And you can generate really cool pictures that way, okay? So, um, Hope you enjoyed that. If you'd like to do some more reading up on the history, it's a lot of fun. I found a lot of stuff in sort of an introductory level to the history on Wikipedia, but there's literally, you know, thousands of books out there on the history of these um, really interesting individuals, Rutherford, the Curies, uh, and Becquerel. Uh, as a side note, we'll be studying some units of radioactivity, and the units of radioactivity that are most commonly used are the Becquerel and the Curies. And of course, the Becquerel is a much lower unit of radioactivity than the Curie, okay? So we'll talk about more of that later.